This conference will now be recorded. Okay, we'll start by looking at the uh, uh, last meeting's minutes. Um, I read through them. I didn't really see anything that I felt needed to be changed, but I open it up to all of you committee members to suggest if there are any other changes. Hearing none, let's move on. Okay. Um, we are happy to say that it looks like there will be some additional re relief funding coming out of Washington as that bill did get signed. And uh, I would uh, ask uh, Ron to give a brief introduction. Happy to say that and proud to say that we have our CEO for RTD with us here today, Deborah Johnson. So let's all welcome her. Okay, Ron, you want to kick it off? Yeah, th thank you, Brett. Um, I will just start by, um, I won't frame this too much. I'll hand this off to, um, <coughs> I think RTD wanted to sort of frame this conversation a bit, but um, the purpose of the agenda topic is uh, clearly given that part of the charge of the Accountability Committee was to review um, the use of the CARES Act funding and other federal relief funding. Um, and now that we know uh, legislation has been passed and signed into law that that will bring some additional federal relief resources to RTD wanted to begin the conversation with the finance subcommittee um, to understand sort of what we what we know what we don't know and sort of start the discussion about any any um, discussion the the accountability committee wants to have to to provide some, any any input or advice to to RTD so with that happy to hand off to Deborah Johnson uh, to kind of uh, introduce the topic from the RTD perspective, and then I'll um, I'll work through sort of a little summary of the of the uh, relief portion of the legislation. All right. Well, good morning, and thank you very much, Ron, for that introduction. And to all of you that are assembled this morning, uh, Deborah Johnson, my pleasure to join you all. So, as stated, yes, the um, COVID relief funding was signed into law. Um, on Monday, December 27th by the president and recognizing that in the attachment B, it contains some of the language as stipulated in the bill, I wanted to provide some qualifiers in relationship to where we are as RTD holistically as an agency and what we intend to do going forward. And then more specifically, share with you um, the status of where we are in sort of this ambigu ambiguous um, point in time. So with that as a backdrop, recognizing that the intent of this additional stimulus money is to ensure the transit agencies that were impacted by the adverse effects from the COVID-19 pandemic and the decrease in ridership, this um, stimulus money has been put forward to ensure that agencies such as RTD could maintain uh, their operational aspects as it relates to frontline operators, um, and other core uh, positions that are benefit in providing service delivery. With that as a backdrop, recognizing that this law was just effectuated on Monday, December 27th, at this juncture, we have yet to receive any formalized information from the Federal Transit Administration relative to uh, Section 5307, you know, in the Code of Federal Regulations as specified, relative to the urbanized area amounts. There's been a lot of speculation, but we have yet to receive specific details. Also, I'd like to qualify that while we're in this state, we have no understanding pursuant to the guidance and how that will be um, provided to us re in relationship to the apportionment. One thing I will say, I received some information last night um, that did qualify for us that we will not be able, highly probable, this isn't totally final, but highly probable that we will not be able to amend our former CARES grant, but would have to initiate a new one. And for those that may be familiar with the process, when FTA does release the tables that outline the apportionment, that that information has to be certified by the Department of Labor, and they in turn have about 30 days to do that. So recognizing that as a backdrop, where we are right now is that RTD is going to continue forward with our uh, reductions um, as relates to our staffing. 
um, to deliver said service. As you know, we have a service change that's coming to fruition that will take effect on Sunday, January 10th. I do want to qualify that it is my intent to reinstate as many frontline employees as we can. However, at this critical time, without knowing any specific information relative to the amount and the guidance, I'm unable to do that. And I have been highly communicative with um, our members um, in the union, as well as uh, members of the RTD board in relationship to that. Um, as you may be aware as well, that when we have gone, or when we went down this path, we wanted to ensure that we were providing um, support for our employees who really have been critical in helping to keep this region moving and have essentially been that critical piece in reference to uh, getting people to and fro, uh, essential employees moving other essential workers, you know, and businesses and things of the like. So uh, we will be providing severance to them. And in doing so, that means they still have to be in our system. So the reason I provide this backdrop is to say that as we go forward and we get more uh, specificity as it relates to what it is that we need to do going forward, it should be more straightforward for us as an organization to reinstate our employees. And um, as it relates to service delivery, the intent behind that and recognizing that we do have a service change that the board approved, um, we are looking at service levels of 60%. Recognizing that we do want to bring employees back in the fold, our objective from a service delivery vantage point is to ensure that we are still providing a safe environment whereby we're looking at our highly traveled uh, routes and we intend to provide supplemental service on those routes. And simply put, you know, to ensure social distancing aspects, we may be putting more vehicles on routes uh, whereby we are limiting the capacity to 15 people on a 40-foot bus, um, 25 on a 60-foot bus, and um, things along those lines as it relates to service delivery. We will be analyzing this as we go forward. And one thing for certain, we're going to remain flexible and agile once we have a determination what it is that we will be able to do with the monies that are being apportioned. Because right now I'm just speaking to you in hypotheticals, not knowing what it is. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of media reports and we've seen um, you know, various estimates of what it may be, but I'd be remiss in my duties if in fact I didn't have factual information when we're dealing with people's lives. So I wanna be very clear as it relates to that. At this juncture, if you're interested in more uh, detail relative to that process, I can yield the floor to um, our acting CFO, Doug McLeod, um, to talk about the process, recognizing this is all reimbursable, very analogous to what happened with the CARES Act money. We have to adhere to those guidelines, which we're still waiting to receive. So I wanted to be forthright in that. So um, Doug, I yield the floor to you if you want to add on any additional information from the process-oriented point of view or anything else you feel germane to the conversation. Uh, thank you, Deborah. I, I think you hit all the relevant points, and yeah, that would be the, the issue is we really need to see what the parameters are for the um, reimbursable amounts. Um, you may recall with the CARES Act itself, one of the requirements is there was no matching requirement, but we actually had to reduce our submissions of expenses for reimbursement by the amount of fares we collected. So I expect there will be some kind of provision um, similar to that. Um, so we'll just have to and see what that looks like. But um, I think you hit all the points, Deborah. Thank you very much. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Ron if there's any questions that individuals have of us. We're more than happy to entertain those and have dialogue around that. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Rut, if I if I can, um, I, I I'll be slightly less careful than than Deborah and Doug. Um, I did share in the agenda packet at least a little bit of an assessment of um, the the legislation that was passed, um, admitting. Uh, Kind of the pieces that are clear in statute and the pieces that are sort of some take some take some um, a little bit of estimating, I guess, if you will. Um, so the the like the CARES Act, the the COVID relief 
portion of the omnibus appropriations bill that was passed by Congress uh, includes about thir includes $13.3 billion to FTA for urbanized area formula grants. Uh, that's in the bill. I'll go, I'll pull up the language and, and get that, but I wanted to lay out some, some high level things. Um, that com that's compared to 25 billion that was included, that was included in CARES Act uh, using similar language. Um, if you do, you know, a little bit, of, a little bit of math, I mean, you could expect that RTD would, would receive it, you know, in the area of 130, 150, maybe up to 170 million dollars under under this provision. I think, you know, clearly, it we're estimating here, and clearly the apportionments uh, will be issued formally by FTA uh, by the end of this month. I think they were they're required within 30 days of enactment of the legislation to do the apportionment um, of of that money. So we'll know more in just in just a couple of weeks, um, and so. The whole point of this conversation is to start the dialogue about, you know, planning for the use of that money, knowing that RTD is going to get some money and not an insignificant amount of money. Uh, and we may we may quibble over the exact dollar figures, and we'll have to wait for the exact dollar figures. Um, so I will let's see, I will pull up just the quick little summary of the legislation here. Pop that on the screen. If I may say so, we understand RTD's reluctance to put any numbers out and that's a responsible thing to do right now but we look forward to hearing the numbers when you get them officially uh, hopefully at the end of the month most certainly yes right thank you for that most certainly once we know what it is uh we will be very forthright in, in sharing information thank you so this was included in the packet. Hopefully, you ever can ever can see this. Um, I've made it about as large as I can make it on my screen. So hopefully, it's at least um, digestible for you. Uh, kind of picked out some of the key provisions relative to the relief to the um, COVID relief portion of the bill relative to a Federal Transit Administration. Um, so again, 14 billion dollars um, to remain available until expended. Um, 13. Point Three billion of that is for grants to recipients um, under the Section 5307. So that's the urban urban grant program uh, of FTA. There's some interesting language here about sort of the different pieces to calculate uh, and apportion those funds. So they're being apportioned under two different formulas, but basically everything's being made available as if it was all 5307 funding at the end of the day once those calculations are done, which is why you know why RTD is you know being appropriately cautious about sort of committing to dollar amount and certainly I don't I won't profess to to know and uh, there's about a 99% chance that my 130 million dollar estimate is wrong um, uh, but again feel like it's it's probably it's probably in the ballpark right um, so again uh, they're they're allocated um, sort of in the same ratios as under the 2020 appropriations bill. Um, again, they have to be allocated uh, by by FTA no less than 30 days after enactment of the bill. So there is a deadline for FTA. So we'll know in short order uh, the details there. Um, the total, there are some limitations. So for, for agencies that got CARES Act funding, there's some limitations um, kind of combining the CARES Act funding with, with this new funding so that um, it can't exceed 75% of the urban areas uh, 2018 operating costs. Uh, so I went and found that information out of the National Transit Database. Uh, that was $663.8 million in 2018 for RTD. 75% of that is $498 million. Uh, so that would be sort of the limit that RTD would be able to, to receive uh, combined from the CARES Act, which was $232 million and money from this COVID relief package. Um, so if it's 130, they're below that below that mark. If it's significantly higher than $130 million, they could potentially start to bump up to that, but it looks like there's there's room there. Um, uh, this, this provision certainly doesn't apply to RTD, uh, but no recipient uh, can receive more than $4 billion combined between the two uh, between the two relief packages. Uh, but it does mean that if there are a, any urban areas, think New York City, uh, the New York region that might might that this might apply to, then anything above the four billion sort of gets redistributed to everybody else uh, first. 
Um, so, uh, you know, that's why it, this is probably a, a could be a conservative estimate. There's some there's some other provisions here. Uh, there's uh, 50 million dollars for grants to recipients of uh, Section 5310 funds, which is uh, funding for en enhanced mobility of seniors and individuals with disabilities. Um, Dr. Cog is the designated recipient of those funds in the Denver Aurora urbanized area. Uh, the rest goes to um, CDOT as the designated recipient for the other areas around the state, and then they allocate those funds. Uh, but again, for, for Dr. Cog, that's we think that's in the range of probably about six hundred or seven hundred thousand um, dollars of funding. So that'll that'll help us kind of beef up some of those services with folks that we have contracts with to provide those provide those services in the region. And then um, there's also uh, six hundred and seventy eight point seven million dollars for the 5311 program grant program, which is rural transit. So those funds go to CDOT uh, for distribution to rural transit agencies for rural transit services. Um, and then the, I think this is the last piece, um, which really gives the legislative guidance for the use of these funds. So very much like the CARES Act uh, program, uh, the legislation specifically says uh, that uh, it, it's uh, for response to COVID-19 health emergency uh, beginning at January 20th to 20, 2020, reimbursement for operating costs to maintain service and lost revenue due to COVID-19, uh, including the purchase of personal protective equipment and paying the administrative leave of operators or contractor personnel due to reductions in service. Uh, this, this first bullet is important. To the maximum extent possible, funds made available um, shall be directed to payroll and operations of public transit, including payroll and expenses of private providers of public transportation, unless the recipient certifies that the recipient hasn't furloughed any employees. So I think this, this legislative language is fairly clear that the intent and the requirement will be to, to use these funds for payroll and operating direct operating expenses. Um, they uh, these some administrative components here. They don't have to be included in a transportation improvement program or a long range transportation plan. So the the, the grant recipient of these funds can can go ahead and make these expenditures without worrying about those. Typically, those kinds of expenditures wouldn't aren't required to be in our regional transportation plans or transportation improvement program anyways. Um, the private providers of public transportation are considered eligible subrecipients uh, to, to, to these funds. So RTD could pay private contractors to provide public transit uh, services with these funds, uh, just like with the CARES Act. Um, and then the, this is important, the federal share, like the CARES Act funding is 100% federal. So there's not a, there's not a match. Um, I think as Deborah and Doug both both stated, you know, there could be some additional guidance from FTA about sort of discounting for fair revenue or other things, um, but ultimately this should not be a barrier to RTD being able to use uh, utilize all of the funds um, that will ultimately come uh, once we see the apportionment tables uh, later this month. So with that, that's my that's my overview. Um, Chair. Chair Bridges, if, if uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or sort of hand it off to you to manage discussion of the subcommittee. Okay, Ron, uh, I, if I can ask a couple first. Uh, one of them, I don't understand the discounting for fair revenue part. Does that mean that the amount that we receive is, is if, if fair revenue is increased, then the amount we receive is reduced by that amount? Yeah, so, I, would, I, would, I would direct that to, to Doug, perhaps, who can describe how that worked for the CARES Act funding. Sure. Doug? Sure. Yes, thank you. And so the way we did it was um, when we submitted expenses. So, for instance, if we submitted um, our payroll expenses for the month of November um, for reimbursement, we had to reduce those by the amount of fair revenue that we collected in November. So we really have to net those two together for the amount of the reimbursement request. Hmm. So fares being down as much as they are, that's probably not as great a deduction as we might like for it to be. Correct. Right. Yes, sir. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask a follow-up. That means that if fares were reduced, for example, to create an incentive for ridership, 
then that would actually benefit the amount that we could be reimbursed? Or is there a caveat against doing that? Sorry to interrupt you. If I may, oh. Sorry, go ahead, Devin. I, sorry, Doug, and I'll yield the floor to you in just a second. So when we talk about the reduction of fares, um, that could be something in which we could look at holistically, but that would be a temporary reduction quite naturally when we stopped with fares to ensure that we were minimizing exposure of the uh, customer to the operator as well. But if we're thinking something more holistic in the sense that we would still have to abide by a fair equity analysis and things of the like as relates to that. So I just wanted to qualify that as required, you know, under the Civil Rights Act. And so, Doug, please add on. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, and I would just say that at least with the last CARES Act and for sure this year, you know, our expenses are in the 500 to 600 million dollar range. So we have more than enough expenses to draw those CARES Act monies even after reducing fares. So reducing fares would probably have more of an adverse impact on us overall when you look at our bottom line. Um, it's not like we don't have enough to draw the full amount of what's awarded to us. So I think, um, you know, that would be a different consideration on the fair side. So the fares, essentially that hits RTD's bottom line, reducing fares, but uh, at the same time, uh, it, it would not have any effect, it sounds like, because our payroll and other expenses are high enough to justify uh, having getting all of the money that's coming from the federal government. So we don't really have a, a concern there that I've seen from what you've described in this, in terms of being able to access all of that by I assume once again, it's within the year. Correct, absolutely. And we do have other grants too. We have preventive maintenance grants that we get on a regular basis, which are about $88 million. We also have enough expenses to draw those. So, you know, initially there, there could be some concern that some of those, we may not have enough expenses to draw both, but um, that should not be an issue. And we still have excess expenses that, um, you know, would qualify if we had more money. It'll be interesting to see how the new transportation secretary, uh, assuming he's appointed, and I think the probability of that increased yesterday, uh, <laughs> that um, we'll see uh, some new thinking from that side too. And uh, this may not be the last support for transit that we have to depend on. But we're, I think, from the committee's perspective, there are a lot of things that we're interested in that would be sort of new initiatives and uh, pilots and things like that to try to find ways to drive ridership because we've had such a phenomenal loss of ridership. It's really critical not to just assume that all those people are coming back as soon as COVID's over. <clears throat> and so part of what we've been trying to do is do some brainstorming on how we can have a, a a long and sustaining impact on ridership uh, to get those folks back. And, and in addition to that, uh, to also uh, think about sort of new, new ways that, that can have benefits for RTD. I think too often we don't look at, at what the value is to the state or to the district of everybody, every person we take off the highways. And congestion. Right now, congestion is not a problem, but it could well, I suspect it will raise its ugly head as it always seems to. Okay, uh, from the rest of the committee members, uh, are there questions that you saw in going through this that you'd like to raise, uh, Rebecca? Yeah, I, um, I hear your um, point on some of the creative ideas, which I'd, I'd love to help explore, but I, can I ask a non-creative question first? Absolutely. <laughs> so if, if it sounds like there's relative certainty that there'd be at least $100 million provided to RTD and quite a bit of certainty that that money will continue to be eligible for, for payroll. And so maybe this is a question for Doug, but look, thinking back to the frontline workers, can you remind us of the amount of money RTD would need to bring back those folks um, that have been furloughed right now? Are you talking about all of those folks that have been furloughed? Because we've had a significant reduction in service, and so naturally there, some of that is, is reduced. And, yeah, I'm thinking more of the operators and the yeah. sort of support staff just to keep the buses running. 
Uh, this is Doug, and so um, I don't know that offhand, but our um, payroll for our represented employees, which includes all of our um, supporting staff, such as um, mechanics, et cetera, is about $250 million a year. But I can get that breakdown. I can find out what we spend on operator salaries and what we expect it to save from the, um, from the layoffs. Um, but yeah, I can provide that to the committee. Rebecca, just as a follow-up, if I may, um, considering, yes, our primary concern is reinstating uh, yeah. a vast majority of our operators, but then again, we'd be remiss in the sense of not having our right size service delivery model to meet the travel demands as well. So that's sort of the quagmire we're in, recognizing that we have 60% of our service now because it's contingent upon where we are taking people to meaning that activity centers have, you know, uh, shuttered in some instances. I'm talking about, you know, schools, universities, not having on-campus learning and things of the like. So I want to ensure that we have an understanding and we're working to look at those ridership trends. So then we'll be quick to pivot and adjust our service delivery model to meet that need as well. Yeah, I understand. And, and I've, I've learned through this process, too, I think a point I've heard you made that it, it also takes a long time to return drivers back, right, because they have a training window. So I guess I was just trying to get a sense if if you know with some certainty that you're getting at least $100 million, what the, what the thought is around when you'll decide whether and how to bring those folks back. Okay, that's a, very, that's a very good question and recognizing that we need to ensure that we understand the guidance and so forth. So um, as we move forward, as relates to these individuals that have been impacted and actually with the workforce reduction, it's my intent with them being, you know, in an administrative state, it would be easier for us to bring those individuals back. So right now, as relates to our frontline operators, we have like two and a half months in which to do that, and I believe it firmly aligns with what we anticipate relative to receiving, you know, the guidance and the ability to put in a grant application to draw down on the fund. So with that as the backdrop, I feel as if we should be able to segue as we go forward, probably, and I use this loosely once again, I got to qualify my statement, you know, probably mid-February, once we get all this shored up, as early as mid-February going forward because we would still have those individuals in the system. We have to ensure that we adhere to the collective bargaining agreement with the Algamated Transit Union 1001 relative to, to seniority and things of the like and what the tenants say relative to part-time versus full-time. So we're right. working in full accordance. Thank you. That helps a lot. Thank you. Is there just a ballpark number of, yeah, you, you're laying off about 400 people? how much that is going to save per month that we could just get a sense of if you're going to bring those back in you know in february how much how long will that 100 million just to use that as a ballpark how many months will we be able to bring back um, those employees just to get a sense right so at least that's a very good question and I'm, and before i let doug address that i want to qualify it so when we talk about roughly 400 positions some of those basically have, um, uh, uh, have been handled through vacancies and attrition. So I don't have that number readily available. I'm actually meeting with the team to shore that up later today as it relates to those numbers. So want to qualify that as it relates to what that number is. It's basically a cost savings from roughly 400 positions. Um, and so our number in reference to actual bodies being impacted was diminished as we start communicating because some individuals opted to retire some individuals found other places of employment where they had some certainty so um with that doug i'll yield the floor to you if you have anything additional to add to address elisa's question thanks sure thank you deborah and, and um you know i think one of the things that deborah had said earlier about we do incur some we are incurring some severance costs and some other costs associated with those employees who have been notified um, we're also uh, paying uh, not just salaries but also for benefits uh, for two and a half months um, and then there's we are self-insured for unemployment so there's a cost there too so there's kind of some it, it would it's not necessarily a net amount that we would save because we do we will still incur for the, those employees incur costs for those employees that are not brought back and 
Um, as Rebecca mentioned too, there's a cost to bringing people back. Um, after a certain period of time, uh, operators have to be, go through a retraining process. If they're new uh, operators, um, they have to go through the full training. Some of them don't have CDLs, et cetera. So it's a, a fairly significant cost. Um, the most recent number I heard for a new employee, new operators in the range of $22,000 by the time all the training and, and uh, uh, preliminary work is done bringing somebody on board. So those are also considerations. But if you want rough numbers, our collective bargaining agreement um, has a pay range for an operator in the range of about $20 to $26, depending on seniority. So if you took a midpoint, $23 times 400 employees, um, multiplied that out, um, you can get, and divide by 12, you can get a monthly savings. Um, I don't have a calculator right here handy with me. I can't do that in my head right now. But that would give you kind of a rough idea. And Elise, as you mentioned, that would just be, it would be temporary based on this funding because at the time that that funding runs out, then we'd have to find new funding to keep those folks on past that point. So that's another consideration. If, if I can ask regarding the retraining cost, is is there a period of time within which, I mean, a lot of these people have probably been drivers for a long time that would be bringing back. Do we have to retrain those people as well? Is, is there some fixed, here's the amount of time and, and should yes. that be reconsidered that amount of time? Because some Very people good. need this training more than others. <laughs> I'm sorry, Deborah, please. No, no, I'm sorry, I apologize. Very good question, Mr. Chair, but yes, there is. Um, as Doug pointed out, we have to ensure that we have a, uh, they have a CDL, but more specifically, if an employee is out and hasn't been in the seat for more than 30 days, they have to go through a retrain. Wow. And it's incumbent okay. upon us to adhere to USDOT as we go forward. Keeping in mind also that when you train a new operator um, from start to finish, that's an eight week training course as well. So that's why when we talk about the period of time in which we have somebody and they're still in the system, we wouldn't have to start from scratch. Yeah, the 30 day thing is really uh, is really surprising because, you know, if someone's been driving for years and they come back and, and it's 31 days later and they have to go through retraining, it seems like an excessive loss of their services while they're training and also a, a great expense. How is the 30 days, is that a, a USDOT regulation or where does that come from? Um, it is USDOT and it depends. Like if somebody's out on a medical leave, right? And they come back, so there's some caveats. So I don't wanna give a full, you know, give a concrete answer because there are some nuances attributed to that. But I would say um, we have a higher level of care, you know, as it relates to federal uh, motor vehicle carriers that we have to adhere to when you're carrying you know, passengers and so forth. So we, to exercise safety and caution, adhere to that 30 day time period. So we could double back and I can get more specific um, for this committee if you're interested, because I don't wanna misspeak. As it relates to my experience, it's always been 30 days and I don't know if there's something else nuanced within the state of Colorado. Well, I would, I would wonder if that's something the USDOT could reconsider. Uh, 30 days seems like people are going to forget the, many of the issues if they've been doing this for years. It seems like it should be based on how many years of service they have, for example, and how long they've, they've been out of it. Well, that's a very good viewpoint. What I have learned, you'd be surprised that individuals that have been actually in the seat for a longer period of time tend to need the retraining more because they've become... Um, sort of familiar and they may not be using the standard practices on which they were trained. And so basically what I have, what I have seen in my past experience, oftentimes um, accidents were happening more with a more seasoned operator. So than it, somebody it, who's newer that has had training. I'm sorry. Sort of like they need a refresher and maybe that's true of all operators. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hmm. Elise? Well, I was just seeing if we could move on to the more creative portion of the conversation. Obviously, bringing back um, folks that had to be laid off is, is certainly a priority, but if we don't actually increase ridership, it's just a stopgap and we'll have to fire them in you know three, four months. Right. So 
at least some of this, and I think that was the gist of um, your recommendations and some of the ones that I put out there, we also need to increase ridership and it would be um, ideal if we could uh, try some things that have a lasting impact that um, transcend the COVID experience and actually move RTD um, in a direction that's even healthier than, than uh, where RTD was um, when we when the pandemic struck. So anyway, I'd be interested in 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 talking through some of the ideas that that you had and others have on that piece of the equation, so that this this jolt this this one time in, in influx of money can be used to actually sustain the system for the long haul. I wholeheartedly agree. I'm, I'm much I'm much more uh, passionate about. Uh, ideas and how we can increase ridership, uh, but at the same time, I do think this has been very useful to better understand the limits of that money that we're getting and uh, and how. Absolutely, we're absolutely, I totally agree. Okay, well, uh, unless there are any further questions, uh, let's let's move on uh, with the agenda. Uh, I I did. Uh, express a preference for trying to get to those issues faster. Uh, accountability committee pl uh, preliminary report. I, I think everyone on the committee has had a chance to look at that. I hope you, that you have. Uh, I, I want to uh, compliment Dr. Cog on the job that they did of putting all that together, uh, you know, especially Matthew and Ron and, uh, and Doug and Doug Rex and all the work that you put in into that as well. Uh, I, I really was quite pleased with the way that turned out. At least, what are your comments? I, I agree. Um, I thought they they made it look good too. How about that? Um, no, it was a good a good uh, historic document about a sort of the ground that we've plowed and also the preliminary um, recommendations around legislation. So yeah. um, hopefully the full committee can adopt it at our next meeting and uh, then we can start on uh, the next report. Yeah, and and uh, I would also uh, say that we appreciate the input from RTD on, uh, on the legislative proposals. Our goal is to give RTD greater flexibility in pursuing some things that could uh, impact ridership in a positive way. Uh, Rebecca? Yeah, so, sorry, Rhett, are you moving on from the, the stimulus discussion? I, I did have one more question there. All right, far away. Hope it's a quick okay. one. <laughs> so it's, um, for us to be most helpful, I'm just wondering from RTD, what is your, your process for making these decisions and at what point is it most helpful for us to be layering in the thoughts of this group? Um, you know, are you bringing it through, I assume, through your normal board process? But I'm just trying to get a sense, Red, of how much time we have and to to provide some of the thoughts we've had and get some brainstorming in. Yes, thank you very much, Rebecca. So basically, we do have guidance that um, the board adopted as relates to uh, financial priorities, especially as related to ridership, uh, that they addressed during the uh, mid-year financial review in November. So. Um, as we look at that going forward, it's to ensure that we don't go below the service levels where we are now. So holistically, as we go forward, we'll be having those discussions, but quite naturally, we have to see where our ridership levels are, do an assessment as it relates to service planning, and hone in on what are the routes in which we have that level of ridership relative to providing supplemental service so we can ensure that we're providing an environment you know, that is safe and conducive that will entice people to want to get back on board as well. So as we go through that process, we will be engaging the board and more than willing to share that information with this group as well as we look proactively with how to best handle the situation, recognizing that we do want to garner, you know, future ridership in, in reference to what um, uh, the chair, uh, Elise Jones, had referenced in reference to the uh, creativity because we'd just be kicking the can down the road if we didn't do that. So holistically, it's delving in, rolling up our sleeves, and figuring out what we can do from a ridership growth action plan to stimulate that ridership going forward. Does that address your question? 
And if it doesn't, so. February. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get a sense of the, the timing. Oh, the timing, I, I apologize. So as it relates for the timing in and of itself, recognizing that we have a service change January 10th, we're gonna put that into effect, right? We okay. do have to monitor the, the, the level of ridership, and we can do that a myriad of ways by having people, you know, we do have APCs, automatic passenger counters, have people in the system monitoring the routes and actually doing the probing of the fare box as we look at who's using what type of fare media. So with all of that as a backdrop, I anticipate you know, contingent upon what this is and when we get the money, if it's late February, I would say in the spring time frame, we, you know, plan for another service change in May. But if anything, if we have to make adjustments going forward, then I say we would work with our partners on the union side of the house as we did before and make adjustments accordingly if we need to adjust service levels. Does that help? I think you wanted a date, and I, I don't think it's possible to, to really. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can't I can't sit here and say that this is the that I can't draw a line in the sand because there's so many unknown variables. Optimally, yeah. as soon as possible, but I just don't know. Maybe in two weeks I could come back and be more definitive. Could I ask the question slightly differently? It will it be a vote of the board? Um on whether and when to bring back um, the employees that were let go, and what board meeting would that discussion occur at? Or would you do that administratively? That's administrative that because that falls, that's not a policy issue in that regard. Um, this basically has to do with the administrative aspect as it relates to employees. And so that would be done relative to ensure that we're right sizing the level of service for the demand as we look at holistically and as I've been very communicative with the board is ensuring that we can you know reinstate individuals but it wouldn't be a holistic viewpoint going forward we are going to try to be creative with other aspects um, and I, I, I don't know what that is as I said before just because of where we are but optimally what I can say considering that we have to do a grant application and draw down on the money once we have an understanding of what that dollar amount is we could probably start making provisions to bring individuals back knowing that we would qualify for said money. So that could be, as I said early on, mid-February, contingent upon FTA providing that information by the end of the month. And would you, and you'd be making those administratively, so there, that would be, that could happen without board action. Um, are you only bringing back people as ridership increases or would you, um, I mean, because you're making the service cuts in January, January 10th, based on your assumptions around what, you know, what operator needs you'll have. So I, I, I'm just curious how you're going to decide how to bring people back until ridership numbers um, increase and what that process is. It sounds like it's an administrative one as well. So let me clarify what I um, was saying, because I may have confused individuals. As we talk about the current environment in which we're operating, we want to ensure that we're providing a safe environment. We would be using what we call supplemental service or trippers, right? Additional buses to ensure that we had adequate spacing. So that would be our intent. We need to ensure that we have operators readily available on what we call our extra board. It's very analogous to having a substitute teacher. You have somebody call out, I need to ensure that I have an operator that could step in. If in fact I had an operator that had some kind of impact from COVID, I need to ensure that I have an operator to stand in. So it would be in our best interest to have operators readily available so we could supplement the service we have, but we also have to be cognizant of the fact that we need to have ample operators on standby per se. So that would still create work for individuals to have outside of doing a service change. Does that make sense? So yep. you could bring people back starting in mid-February to implement the existing, the January service changes. You're gonna need more people to supplement. So you would be bringing people back immediately then. I would qualify it as such because one thing, and I'll just add this and I'll, 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 I'll stop rambling. Um, one thing that I have learned going forward, considering that this is a labor intensive industry, we have individuals that may be out on workers comp, nothing to do with the pandemic. And so as we look at our numbers, we have to ensure that we have that percentage. So yes, 
we could start bringing individuals back so we can ensure that we maintain our level of service uh, and maintain our schedules as we put them forward. Okay, um, we really need to move forward, but Lynn, if, please uh, go ahead. Just to, to sort of add to, to the answer to those questions, I've been working with Deborah closely on all of this and, and uh, with the board, with Angie, and, and I think all of the board is, uh, you know, all of the board members are very interested in bringing ridership back. And um, I'll be taking what the accountability committee is brainstorming about, Troy and I will, you know, back to the board. I think that, uh, you know, we'll be starting starting to have those conversations. Hopefully we'll be going to smaller committees here in the near future that can can uh, delve into some of those things better. So um, your conversation, uh, you know, Deborah's right. There's no there's no set time, but I think I think the ideas are all very helpful, and, uh, and uh, the board is is right there too. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Lynn. I I just want to uh, ask the committee members if there's anything specific that you want to ask about the accountability committee preliminary report. I think all of you have had a chance to see it. Hopefully we can move on to the uh, next level after that. Ron? Really sorry, Rudd, I know you wanna move on, but I do wanna point out two things. Um, so the preliminary report did get issued with the full committee agenda packet Monday evening. So hopefully uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, that's where you can find it to, to look at it. I do wanna right. point out two things. Uh, that were refined in the preliminary report in terms of the formal recommendations on legislative recommendations from the package that was voted on by the accountability committee that with this preliminary report would be refined as it gets adopted. One is um, we discovered with the um, legislative council, the bill drafter at uh, the legislature, that sort of the, the initial proposal to strike a whole section related to parking management uh, we probably needed to be a little bit more surgical. So we have generalized the language in this uh, to give us some ability to work with legislative council and the legislature to sort of uh, kind of be a little bit more precise on some of those changes to make sure that we're not getting rid of uh, authority that RTD needs in order to effectively manage its parking. And then the other was um, at the request of RTD, uh, as you'll remember that for the contracted services, um, the original proposal was not uh, dealing with the um, limit of 58% uh, in terms of contracting service, contracting out services. Uh, there was some feedback uh, from RTD uh, to, to request striking that provision, so getting rid of that limit of um, contracting out uh, at the 58%. I think we're gonna we're gonna want a a, a, a conversation. Uh, with the committee before that before that revision gets gets changed. So just anticipate a, a little bit more of a conversation about that at the full accountability committee next week. That's all I've got on the plenary report. And I, I'd also say that Elise is working directly with the bill drafter to try to uh, clarify some of those outstanding issues. So you got the ball, Elise. Yeah, and I, I think that'll be informed by Monday's call because of the the way that the legislative session is going to run this year, we actually have extra time because they're not going to move legislation until February. So um, that makes our, our late timing perfect. <laughs> but but we are waiting. Yeah. I will add, it, this is to, to Deborah. we are waiting to hear some final feedback on, on, on both of those points to, so that we really understand um, RTD's official viewpoint on those. Um, and that will inform the committee's discussion, I'm sure, on Monday. Good. Okay. So let's move on to the brainstorming part. Uh, I, I'll start out by saying there's a lot of material here, and I appreciate everyone's input on this, but uh, we're not going to get through this uh, today. But I want to dedicate our next meeting to really focus on brainstorming issues and, and new ideas and all of it directed uh, towards the issue of how we can build ridership, not just recover what we had before, but actually hopefully build it beyond uh, where we were in 2019. So um, with that, Elise, do you wanna uh, start by talking about, okay, if I can say one thing, I, I th I'm a little concerned about, about going forward and here's how we're gonna address ridership and all those other things until we really understand 
why we have lost all the writers that we've lost. And I think we need a poll, a very simple, short, and I proposed a four question poll to get at the, the issue of why we, why people are out. Is it COVID? I've heard it from a lot of people. It's COVID, it's we're all working it from home or we lost our jobs and, and we really haven't got hard evidence. And in business, if, if you have a problem with losing customers, the solution is not ready, fire, aim, it's ready, aim, fire. We have to know what we're aiming at and what we can get to in order to really understand uh, how we're gonna bring those riders back. And so that's, that's the goal of that poll. I've got a couple of others on there, but I'd like to turn it over to Elise to uh, bring forward some of the things she put in there too. Well, let me just start by saying I agree with you on um, being data driven about this. I think some of the preliminary data on on the routes that RTD has done has indicated that certainly what's happening with regional routes coming out of Boulder is that sort of the white collar professionals are working from home, so they're not using transit, and that a lot of the ridership does seem to be uh, this sort of blue collar front line transit dependent workers, where it's not an you know where they can't work from home, but I agree getting a better sense of wh why what ridership dropped and what I, I think surveying people on what it would take to get them to uh, move to, back to transit or move to transit would be really helpful. Um, I it, um, sent out a list to the group um, that was sort of Boulder County folks brainstorming and I think that the, the ideas should be read from the top to going down. I think some of the things suggest at the bottom around infrastructure probably wouldn't work with the, the funds um, as they've been characterized. But at the top of the list is really um, looking at um, discounting passes and um, reducing fares to spur ridership. And it's an opportunity to pilot different ways of doing that. I think there's a twofold one is is increasing ridership and addressing equity concerns associated with COVID because it would appear and it warrants it warrants more study that the folks that are using transit now are the folks that have been hardest hit in, uh, monetarily um, are tend to be our low income workers so anything we could do to to help them out um, now is a good good thing from a societal standpoint um, so to 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 really take the opportunity to investigate how we could um, subsidize, subsidize riders in a way to bring people back. Um, there, uh, one of the key, there've been a number of suggestions in the operations committee about how to improve and simplify and the, the, the pass program, like the live program, to go right. ahead and start implementing those um, now. Um, uh, you, uh, improving and accelerating implementation of RTD's new smart card account-based system. Now, those will set the, the foundation for increasing ridership, I think, both now and post-COVID. Uh, another key issue that's come up, and it's hard looking at it from the RTD standpoint, if you step back and look at it from the transit system standpoint, one of the uses of the, the CARES Act funding um, could be to help out other transit service providers who are providing some of the um, serv transit service we need in the metro area, uh, VIA and other transit operators are struggling. Um, and we may want to look at sort of partnerships in terms of how we're uh, providing ridership in different areas and who's providing it. Um, another idea was um, using the funding to leverage new types of partnerships, um, you know, taxi voucher systems, um, trying to set up partnerships with new job centers, um, that kind of thing. So those were some of the um, all, uh, ideas that we had on our list. And I, I hope I got it out to everybody. I just I just uh, used Rhett's email list just to again spur thinking on how we could make um, ridership return and make the system better than it was um, pre-COVID. Right. Kristen? I actually think that the point that you bring up, Elise, as far as the past programs and also subsidizing some of the fares should be one of the questions that should be added to Rhett's list of 
why did you leave? Uh, why, did, why are you no longer riding RTD? Is it the cost? Is that stopping you from using public transportation? I think to some, to some degree, we're kind of down, I don't want to say down to, but a lot of the people that are using RTD are people that don't have alternatives. Right. And they are transit dependent. And, and uh, you know, those are the people who are economically the most disadvantaged as well in many cases. Not exclusively, but in, in a lot of cases. Go ahead, Kristen, would you finish your thought? However, it kind of goes back to one of the board meetings that I attended that um, two teenage boys came up to the podium and said, because we cannot afford to ride RTD, we have to make the decision between going to school or having lunch. <clears throat> so there is a possibility that these people, although they are essential workers, and they absolutely have to be at their jobs. Sometimes I'm sure that they are having to really be creative on how to get to and from their jobs. Are they going to walk? Are they going to hitchhike? Are they going to ask a neighbor? So I think that that is a legitimate question to ask these RTD missing writers. Great. And it's just, it's one more question. All right, I'll, I'll look. At, I'll look at the poll and see. But the critical part about polling like that is is it's got to be tight and short, or people don't respond to it. But that is a that is a good question and a good issue. And I'll think about how we might be able to uh, do it. Maybe I'll drop the COVID questions and use that instead. I don't know. So, um, uh, Ron, were you? Did you have something you needed to add? We're almost out of oh, time. Sorry, I was I was waving goodbye to Chris Frampton. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, we we are now out of time. I want to respect everyone's time, uh, but be prepared at our next meeting to have a longer discussion about uh, some of these kind of out of the box issues. And at least maybe you could go through that Boulder list and and see if there are things you want to trim out of it, so that we we focus on the things that have the greatest impact and the greatest potential to actually happen absolutely i was just trying to stir the pot <laughs> well that's good and from the people who haven't stirred the pot yet uh, uh i would encourage you uh to to stir the pot uh with us and um with that uh, uh rebecca and dan uh y you know if you have ideas i'd, I'd love to hear those those as well as as yours, Chris. And with that, let's uh, let's call the meeting to an end. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Appreciate your participation. <laughs>